Thank you, Joy. What a blessing it is to have opportunities to preach. And uh, of course, if you're a preacher, you understand that. And it's a great responsibility. There's never a time that I go anywhere, if I'm traveling or here, that I do not, before I stand to speak, always look at the carpet or the floor right behind God's pulpit. And I always say, I know that I'm standing in the grace of God. And it is a great joy to preach the word of God, no doubt about it. But the older I become, the more I look back in retrospect and think about the past and review life and look back at all the things that God has brought me through. And a lot of times we identify our Christian walk with the Lord out of our personal experience. But as I have studied over the years and learned about great men and how God used them, I have found that everything that we learn is still always in part. We never attain, we never get to the height where we should be. We are always students of the word of God. And I love to study the period with Mr. Moody and Mr. Spurgeon and of course G. Campbell Morgan, Hudson Taylor. I love that particular time in our history. And I find that the longer I study there, the more I realize that there was a great moving of God, not only here in America, but around the world. And so I have thought in recent days, as I've looked back, I wonder what it was. What was it that God gave them or the insight that they received of the Lord that helped them to attain and to accomplish the things that they did in that generation in which they lived? I remember Curtis Hudson used to always say this. He said, this generation of saints will give an account to God for this generation of sinners. In other words, we that live in the generation that rubs shoulders with us, we will give an account to God for one day. And we know that the faith was once delivered unto the saints, but it has to be declared in every generation. And so tonight, the subject in which I chose as God impressed it upon my heart is such a large subject. Mr. Moody was a great preacher of the past and of course was used mightily. But Mr. Moody never one time ever preached from John 3.16. And someone asked Mr. Moody, they said, all of these years you've preached and you've yet never preached from John 3.16. And his answer was this, yes. He said, I've referred to it hundreds and hundreds of times, but he said, I could never scale that mountain, the love of God. And he said, I couldn't preach from it. I would always just refer to it. And tonight, as we look into the word of God, I want to give you an illustration just in recent days that Mr. Henry Drummond used and was such a blessing to me, I thought I'd share it with you. You know, he's, he was a scientist, and of course, Mr. Moody said he was the greatest young man, had the greatest mind of any young man that he had ever met. In fact, when he met him there in Europe, he said, I want you to take leave of college, and I want you to travel with me for the next two to three years, for he said, I would love for you to speak to young people. He said, you have a real grip on the scriptures, and he said, I know that you speak very well and you'll make a great impact. And so Mr. Drummond did travel. And as he traveled with Mr. Moody, Mr. Moody taught him many things about ministry and the Lord. And of course, uh, young uh, Drummond was a, a brilliant young man. But in recent days, I've been reading some of his articles. And one of the articles that I just finished and read was how to learn how. In other words, he said, how do we learn truth? How do we receive truth? And so he gave some illustration, but he gave one. He said, you know, I'm a scientist. And he said, I use a microscope a lot. And he said, when I want to look at anything that troubles me or anything I want to investigate, he said, I put it under the microscope. And then he said, I magnify it and I bring it into focus. And he said, 
not too long ago, I was doing that, and he said, I looked at an organism, he said, I didn't recognize. He said, I couldn't understand it. He said, I've never, ever seen anything like this. And he said, so I went to adjust the bottom of the microscope, realizing that at that moment, I hadn't taken off the bottom lens. And so he said, what I was looking at is all the dust and all the things were on the bottom of the lens. But he said, when I took that off and I readjusted, he said, it clearly came into sight. But he said something else happened immediately to me. He said, I over magnified the specimen that I was looking at at the expense of blurring out everything else around it. And he said, I begin to think about life and how it is with truth and how we learn. Sometimes we as God's people, as we are studying the word of God, we want to learn truth and we get excited about a truth, but sometimes it is possible to over magnify that particular truth or principle at the expense of blurring out others that disconnect themselves from it. And he said, I've learned through the years the best way to learn truth is to make sure that I bring it into the right magnification, but never at the expense of of blurring out other things that are around me. And as we look into the word of God tonight, I want us to make sure that we understand how important the subject is in which God has spoke to my heart about. And I hope he will do the same to yours tonight. As a way of introduction, I want you to take the word of God and go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter number 22. And as a way of introduction, I want to give you some verses before we go to our text. But in Matthew chapter 22, we know that Jesus Christ is going to give two commandments. And in verse number 37, it says, And Jesus said unto them, him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. Go over to Mark chapter number 12 just for a moment. I want to read two verses there. Mark chapter 12. Again, Jesus Christ is going to give these two Commandments, but there's something said here in Mark that is not said in Matthew. Mark chapter 12, verse number 30, it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like name, uh, uh, and the second is like Namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And then if you would go over to the book of John just for a moment. John chapter number 13 and verse number 34. Again, he is speaking about this commandment of love. And in John chapter 13, verse number 34, it says a new commandment. I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye, ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. You know, I was thinking about this subject of love. We know in the New Testament, especially. There are different words there's, that represent the divine love of God. And then there are other words that, de, that give us a description of the love of mankind, human love. But all through the New Testament, our Lord Jesus Christ is always calling Christians up to the divine love in which he has commanded us. And as we go to our last passage of scripture, before we go to the text, if you go to John chapter number 21... I want us to be reminded when Jesus went and of course he denied the Lord thrice and it says he followed the Lord afar off. But we know after the resurrection of Christ, 
The Lord Jesus Christ met him again up at the Sea of Galilee with some of the other disciples. And Peter was restored. But the Lord Jesus Christ, here in John chapter 21 and verse number 15, he asked Peter three times if he loved him. Verse number 15 says, And when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Our Father in heaven tonight, as we think about the word of God, as we think about the subject in which we are approaching tonight, I pray that you would help all of us to have real discernment in our hearts. We thank you and praise you for all that you're doing in our hearts and lives and help us to be, be obedient to the word of God. And I thank you for what you are going to do us, in us and through us. And we ask these things in thy precious name. Amen. Just a thought here. The Lord Jesus Christ asked Peter, he said, lovest thou me? The word love there is the divine love of God up here. Peter said, yea, Lord, I love thee humanly speaking. So he said the second time, Peter, lovest thou me more than these, divine love? Peter said, yea, Lord, I love thee humanly. And then the Lord Jesus Christ did something very unusual that I thought about for over the last 30 years. He said the third time, lovest thou me, Peter, humanly, and Peter said, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. I've always questioned and wondered why did the Lord go from divine love in the third time asking Peter, humanly speaking, do you love me? And then I begin to think about Peter. And of course, we have application and we know that he denied the Lord three times and of course three times the Lord asked him if he loved him. But I think there's a much greater meaning there than that. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ says that we are to divinely love him. That we are to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind and soul. The divine love of God. You and I must realize tonight that it is absolutely impossible to have the divine love of God manufactured through humans. God must enable us and give us that love through the highway to God's love. And tonight, I want us to think about Peter just for a moment in this fashion. When the Lord Jesus Christ came down to Peter's level and he said, Peter, lovest thou me humanly? And when Peter said, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that you love me. Peter, I believe, was saying, Lord, you know all my downfalls. You know all the times that I made promise to you, humanly speaking, and every time that I failed and fell short and walked away and faltered and fell and yet you still love me. But again Peter was saying Lord I have tried my whole life to serve you in my own strength, in my own love and I know now I can't do it. And so I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ and we know that love, the divine love of God always descends comes down. He comes down to where you and I are and he asks us the question, 
do you really love me? And until we realize that we can't manufacture that love, the divine love that God wants to give us, and until we come to the end of ourselves and we recognize that it isn't but for the grace of God enabling us through obedience to his word that he will enable us and give us the love that he wants us to love him back with and that is the very agape love that God wants to give you and I. All through the New Testament, there's another word synonymous, the word charity. The word charity, I think sometimes today in our own language, sometimes we've diminished that word and we used it in terms where it may not have the impact or have the uh, depth or definition that it once had. But in the New Testament, it's one of the most powerful words when it has to do with God's love. With that in mind, I want you to go to our text, if I could, found in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Many of you have read this very text many, many times, but I want to use this tonight, and I want to give you what God has spoke to my heart about, about this chapter right here. And the longer we read, of course, we are constantly learning. The Word of God is opening, opening, opening constantly. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse number 1, the Apostle Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity vaunteth not, or envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there shall be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part should be done away with. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, Charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. You know, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as the Apostle Paul is speaking here, we find that this chapter is divided into three sections. The first section, verses 1 through 3, is love contrasted. And verses 4 through 6, we find love analyzed. And then verses 7 through 13, we find love defended. When we look here in 1 Corinthians 13, it is absolutely overwhelming the elements that we find about love. And yet again, how can we really magnify or open up or try to understand the real depth of what that chapter really means? As way of illustration, if a scientist stood up here tonight and he held up a prism and he took a bright white beam and he shined it through that prism, as it went in on one side, it would be a single white beam and when it came through on the other side, it will be broken up into component colors, red, blue, green, yellow, violet, all the colors of a rainbow. 
amazing. And yet again, as we look here at 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, with that in mind, we find the Apostle Paul as he takes the beam of God and transfers it through his spiritual mind that God has enabled, we see out of that mind comes nine elements to love. And as we look here, I want us to quickly go down and look at these nine elements that we find that is a description or analyzed by the Apostle Paul to help you and I to understand. When God says we are to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, mind, and soul, he is speaking of what love really is. And so love defined or love described is found right here in these nine elements. The first one we find in verse number four is patience. The Bible says, love suffereth long. In other words, you and I as God's people, the great attribute of love is becoming patient. And I don't know about you, but this is something that I work on every single day, is being patient. And we know when we pray for patience, according to James, we get tribulation. And so tonight, as you and I, as God's people, as we mature or as we become more well-rounded in the Christian life, we should become a better Christian. Not a bitter Christian, but a better Christian. There are a lot of Christians today that have served God faithfully. They've been in church all of their lives, but a lot of them now are now coasting. They're doing the will of God from the head, no longer doing it from the heart. And now they're head Christians instead of heart Christians. But you and I as God's people, God says that the first element of love that you and I need to understand is that we are to be a patient Christian. There in Psalm 37 verse seven, it says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. The little word fret there is, it's like you and I, everyone that is born, we have a small mechanism within us. And when we see other people being blessed or we see things that people have and we don't think they really deserve them, that word fret kicks in and we begin to not only fret, but we can become agitated. And you and I as God's people, we know we're beginning to grow when we no longer are fretting or judging people. We become patient with them. I'm glad that my wife is patient with me. Sometimes she'll, she'll say, Bob, did you take your pills? Years ago, someone said, there's all kinds of pills in this world. There's hee-hee pills, ho-ho pills, ha-ha pills, Wake up pills, go to sleep pills, but there's one pill everybody needs, and that's the gospel pill. That's the best pill right there. Well, I need that one first. But you know what? Sometimes we forget. And if we don't watch it, we can become very upset because we have forgotten to do something. But you and I as God's people tonight, we have to understand that God wants to change us. You know, a lot of times we pray for God to change the circumstances when God wants to change us to the circumstances. He wants us to see it with different perception. You know, through the word of God, we find time and time again that the Lord himself has the power to conceal himself and then reveal himself. All through the New Testament, he did that. But you and I as God's people, we need to pray that he will help us to be patient. Number two, quickly. In verse number four, kindness. It says, end as kind. In other words, this has to do with looking to do kind things for people. Mr. Moody used to call them looking for small kindnesses to do for people. Always look for small things that you can do, a word of encouragement. The preacher's always reminding us here about being kind and being friendly and always trying to do our part this is one of the friendliest churches I've ever been in. People are always trying to give a word of encouragement. Just before uh, 
I came in here, uh, several people said, Brother Crichton, we're praying for you. One of the men came by. I was in my office there. He knocked on the window, and he went like this, Pastor. Now, I didn't know if he was saying, I'm praying for you, or I'm begging you not to preach. One or the other. I don't know what it was. <laughs> Only he knows in God. But you know what? We have to learn to be kind. This old world needs a dose of kindness in it because it's crude and rude wherever you go. Number three, quick, quickly, generosity. Love envieth not. Generosity, it means that you and I as God's people, we are not in competition with others that are doing a better job. In other words, when you see someone possibly doing the same job that you're doing, if they are doing a better job, do you have a tendency to become ill-willed towards them? Or do you get sort of upset at them? Or do you feel that you need to be in competition with them? One of the great things about God, when he created you and I, he created us all different. Now we can emulate and we can pick up good uh, things to put into our life, but never to the point where we are racing against each other because God's called us all to do something for him, for his honor and glory. There may be some, someone that has more ability or more talent or a, a well-rounded even more, but you and I are never to become jealous of them. And then number four, quickly, what about humility? Love vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. You know, learning to live the condescending life is a very difficult thing. John said there in John 3 and verse 30, he said, he must increase, I must what? Decrease. The apostle Paul, in his walk with God, when he was first saved, he made reference, he said that I am least of the apostles. And then in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, he said, I'm less than least to the saints. And then last of all, he said, I'm chief of all sinners. You see, he learned the condescending life. It is hard to sometimes compliment others that are doing much better than we are. Or sometimes that, that, that uh, urge in your heart might become to the point where you want to be boastful I like what the Word of God says here in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. It said, Let nothing be done through vain strife or vain glory, but in all lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man to his own work, his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And then verse 5, of course, is familiar. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And then, of course, it goes on to tell us what a wonderful servant our Lord was and how he said there in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, I am meek and lowly of hearts. And so tonight, he wants us to become humble. And then quickly, number five, courtesy. What about courtesy? Doth not behave itself unseemly. You see, courtesy today, we were just talking about Brother Bobby Robertson. When I think of a southern gentleman, I think of Dr. Bobby Robertson. He's one of the kindest men, one of the kindest men that I've ever met. And through the years, he has always been a southern gentleman. I know he's a great preacher, pastor, but he's always been a southern gentleman to me. And there in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Put ye on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you also, forgive ye. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And so tonight, we are to be People that are courteous. Number six, what about unselfishness? Verse five, seeketh not her own. 
You know, you and I have to learn not to be self-centered. We have to become selfless and promote others and help others to attain. Mr. Moody talked about a man who was saved who was a very stingy type of a person. And he said, this man came to him one night. He said, Mr. Moody, he said, I've genuinely been saved. And he said, God's done something in my heart. He said, I want to give something. He said, you do. He said, well, I have two men that need a job. He said, could you hire them? He said, yes, I will. He said, how much should I pay him? He said, you pay him whatever you think's good. And so the two men came quickly. They said, we'd like to work. They worked. They, he said, what do you need? They said, all we want is some food. He went out to the smokehouse there and he said, the devil said, whatever you do, give him the smallest ham in the smokehouse. And he turned around and said to the devil, he said, there was a day I would have listened to you, devil, but he said, if you don't be quiet, he said, I'll give him every ham in the house. <laughs> Something had happened in his heart. He was no longer stingy. He was no longer self-centered. He became selfless about his things. And then number seven, quickly, what about good temper? Verse five says, not easily provoked. This is one that I've had to work on I don't know how many years. I'm still working on it. I'm Scottish, full blood Scott, and boy, I tell you, I can go from a zero to a thousand in a heartbeat or less. It takes the grace and the mercy of God. Just a few months ago, I was talking to Dr. Don Sisk. We were standing after a meeting that we were at together, and he said, Brother Bob, he said, I've been going through some real tough times. He said, you know what? He said, God has sent some people my way all through my ministry to be sandpaper, to sand on me all the time. There's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? You see a lot of personalities, a lot of different type situations where people, if we don't watch it, they can become abrupt in our lives. But you know, sandpaper comes in all different grits. You have starting at uh, 50 grit, which is a, a large, and that is really knocking off real high ridges. And then, of course, it's reduced all the way down. But may I say to you tonight, you might be going through some things that God is working on you to, so that you might have a good temper. You see, you need to let God temper your temper. Any steel that is made has to be reheated to be tempered, to be hardened so it is useful for its purpose. And you and I as God's people, yes, we will have flare-ups, but we need to permit God to temper our temper. And then number eight, guiltlessness. Notice verse five, thinketh no evil. You know what that means? It simply means all you do is seek the truth. You don't want to hear anything negative. You want nothing to do with anybody that has a story to tell you. You want nothing to do with it. There are Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are good, or whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And then the last one, simply, sincerity. Verse 6. Rejoiceth not and iniquity. In other words, he will accept only what the facts are. Only what the facts are. I like what Paul said in Romans 2.11. He said, for there is no respect of persons with God. And I'm glad that God holds us all on an even field. And that you and I as God's people tonight as we come to chapter 13, the Lord Jesus Christ said these nine elements are the elements that describe the love that you're supposed to love me with. So the next time the Lord says, or next time you read in your devotions, do you love me? Will you be like Peter and say, yea, Lord, I loved you. Or will you permit God to bring you up to the divine love by meeting the qualifications? Someone has said years ago, 
that the Christian life is not casual, it's causal. The Christian life is not casual, it's causal. In other words, the Christian life just doesn't unfold and happen for you. But there's a real cause in the way it opens up for you by your obedience to walking with God. And tonight what we need, we need some Christians that will determine in their hearts that they are going to seek the Lord with all of their hearts and to walk with God. Let's pray. Father, tonight, thank you for the word of God. And I pray tonight you would help all of us to determine in our hearts that we are going to walk with God and to love you and to plead with God and to obey the Lord through the word of God and to walk with you and to seek you. And tonight there may be someone here this very night struggling in their own personal walk and wanting direction from thee. And I pray that the Spirit of God would prompt their hearts and help them to see the truth. And Lord, many of us at times have been like Peter. You've asked us in the small, still voice, do you love me? And we have said, yes, we do, but not realizing it was through human means. Help us to rise above and to walk with thee in Christ's name. Pastor.